Hello and welcome to the Caregivers Podcast, where we discuss all types of dementia and hopefully share some caregiver stories along the way. My name is Kimberly Scott and I'm a part-time caregiver to my mother, who at age 65 was diagnosed with early onset dementia, and that was about seven years ago, to give caregivers a place to tell their story when they're ready, to continue the education for those who don't know about dementia and what to do if their loved one is diagnosed. But most importantly, I want to get people talking about having a tough conversation about the what if their loved one is diagnosed and then what, what the plan is. Because I wish I had had that tough conversation with my mom way before she was diagnosed. If you want to share your story or you have knowledge about dementia and want to be a guest on Caregiver Stories podcast, visit thatkimberly.com to sign up to be interviewed. And while you're there, you can also pick which platform you prefer to listen to the podcast on, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Google, YouTube, Alexa, and SoundCloud, and a couple other places. So now that I got that out of the way, I'd like to introduce today's guest, Miss Lisa Skinner. Hi, Lisa. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. So tell the listeners a little bit about your background, who you are, and what led you to the work you do today. Okay, and thank you for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. So I actually am a behavior specialist, and I have worked with families whose loved ones suffer from some form of brain disease that causes dementia. We know there are over 70 brain diseases that do cause dementia. Wow. 70? Seven, over 70, yes. Wow. Okay. And uh, of course, Alzheimer's is the most common, yeah. yes. And I honestly don't know of a case of Alzheimer's disease that didn't include dementia, but there actually are several brain diseases that the afflicted person can have dementia or not have dementia. And a, a really famous case is Michael J. Fox with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a disease that dementia can accompany or you can be like Michael J. Fox and have Parkinson's disease and not have any cognitive impairment whatsoever. Wow. I didn't know that. That's new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's several brain diseases out there that can have dementia attached with it and some that, you know, don't necessarily. My story goes back 40 plus years with my grandmother mm -hmm. and I was just a teenager then and she was displaying some pretty bizarre behaviors and turns out she had some form of dementia, uh, probably Alzheimer's disease and that was my very first experience with that. I have since over the years had eight family members with dementia. Wow of them, blood relatives, and some of them relatives that had married into the family. Mm -hmm. I decided at some point in my life, because my degree is in human behavior, that I wanted to kind of become an expert mm -hmm. from a psychosocial approach. So what I mean by that is I've studied the behaviors that accompany folks with dementia, and there are some pretty bizarre behaviors, and a lot of people <laughs> don't They're understand good. that it's part of the disease. Yeah. They think that their loved one has just completely gone off the rails. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the behaviors are very common. Mm -hmm. They are part of the disease. So over the last 25 years, I have worked with families to help them understand the behaviors that are associated with dementia and the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, which are a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. And yeah, yeah. so a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called mm -hmm. Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. Wow. Basically what that means is just because you have dementia, you're not lost to the world. There are a lot of like tools that they can have in their tool belt to know about the disease that will help them understand what's happening with their loved one 
know how to respond to the different behaviors because what I discovered is our instinctive response to a lot of the behaviors is counterintuitive. Yes, I Almost agree. We have to retrain ourselves to respond to the behaviors that are associated with dementia. Yes, retrain and retrain yourself with patience, may I add. Oh my goodness, patience is key. Yes, it really yes. is. Yeah. So the reason why I wrote the book is one of the families that I visited about five years ago. And I find it interesting because my story kind of piggybacks on what your introduction said, that a lot of people, once they get a diagnosis, they don't know what to do next. Yeah. So this is really an interesting story, how I came to write the book. I went over to this family's home. They had called me. They wanted to, I guess you could say, pick my brain. Yeah. Because I had a counseling and placement service that I had run for years, helping people find appropriate placement for either memory care or assisted living. And they were dealing with two different family members, the wife's father had Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. and my husband's mother had some form of dementia. They called it Alzheimer's, but I don't know if that was a diagnosis. You know, it's really difficult to, to make that diagnosis. I found that they automatically lump when they're not sure and they just call it dementia, that they lump it in with Alzheimer's instead of just, you know, that's how I was in the beginning until I realized that dementia was a symptom of all these other diseases, you know, I, I was saying 20 diseases. I didn't know that there were 70 plus brain diseases Yeah. on top of that. But yeah, I, it, it took me a while to, to learn, you know, that. Well, one, of, so. one of the most common questions I get is what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Mm -hmm. Really easy way to explain that. Dementia is a broad term used to describe the symptoms that accompany one of the 70 brain diseases. Got it. So when we have the flu, if we get the flu, we all suffer a variety of different symptoms. And you know, you can line 10 people up who all have the quote unquote flu, but their symptoms could be very different. Mm -hmm. You know, some people get the chills and the fever and the body aches, but not everybody gets all the symptoms. Dementia is really a term used to describe symptoms that accompany a brain disease. That's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So when you talk about dementia, it's really you're describing symptoms and not everybody displays the same symptoms. Mm -hmm. Some people get the hallucinations. Some people get the delusions. Some people get the paranoia. Some people don't get any of those. Some people get angry. Some people don't. Yes. Some people, yeah. Exactly right. So those are all symptoms that are lumped under the umbrella term dementia. Yeah. So dementia is not a disease. It's the symptoms of the disease. Yes. I've been trying to tell people that. I might substitute that in my opening in the, <laughs> after this one. So Feel free <laughs> because it's a great way for people to understand the difference because yeah. People think dementia is a separate disease. Yeah, no, I agree. And learning and meeting the people that I have met over the past seven years, it's a huge ongoing education because you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Uh, just to circle back to, so you, you met with this family. because Yes, yeah, so and that was their exact reason. They didn't know what they no. didn't know. Yeah. And they, they heard about me. So they called and asked me to come over and they really just wanted to get some information. They didn't want to place their mother or their father in an assisted living or memory care environment. They just wanted to get some information. Mm -hmm. So we talked to her about two and a half hours. And Lisa was the wife's name also. She stopped me after about two and a half hours and she said, you know, Lisa, I just want to say to you that we both got our diagnoses, my dad and my husband's mom, about two and a half, three years ago. And we have gained more information from you in the last two and a half hours than we have from any medical professional in the last three years. Basically, our experience was, here's your diagnosis, and that was it. And they didn't know what to do, what resources were out there. 
And she says to me, she goes, you really need to write a book because people need, they're desperate for this information. Yeah. But I had heard that, you know, for years. So I finally just kind of bit the bullet and did it. Mm -hmm. Wrote the book and it became a bestseller and it's now being turned into a screenplay. Awesome. Congratulations. Is, okay. there, an audio, is there an audio version? There is an audio version. Yeah! I love yeah. that. You can find it on Amazon and it's called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. Okay. So I kind of just stepped away from my counseling business and wrote the book that took me over a year. And then I was, you know, kind of marketing that. And so now what I do is I have a blog mm -hmm. and on my blog, I basically share tips to help people understand the disease and the behaviors associated and how to respond to them. And I also lead a caregiving group, but that's, you know, just at a specific place here in California. But a lot of the information that we talk about in the support group, yeah, you'll find on the blog. So the number one thing I think that I my takeaway from all these years of working with families, the number one thing I think that is missing or lacking is a comprehensive understanding of brain disease, the behaviors that are associated with the disease, and how to respond. Because mm -hmm. like I said, the, a lot of the responses are counterintuitive. It's kind of like you want to correct somebody if they get the date wrong or mm -hmm. whatever. And so I teach people how to respond to behaviors. And what that helps them do is not only understand what's happening to their loved one, but mm -hmm. it also helps them have a much higher quality relationship with their loved one when it's not quite as stressed. Yeah. It yeah. typically is when they don't understand what's happening and why they're talking about things that absolutely make no sense at all. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I do, it's from a psychosocial aspect, the mm -hmm. everyday challenges that will help people have a easier time going through this journey with their loved one. Yeah, because it is. It's a journey. Just speaking from my standpoint, when my mom was diagnosed, it was a handful of friends that had been through it or were going through it that gave me direction or advice that I listened to. Because when you Google it, there's so much that's very overwhelming. So I went first and took guidance from anybody who would give me, you know, like, here, we tried this and this worked for us or do this. And that was a year and a half to two years, but still very overwhelming in figuring out you know, financials and getting power of attorney and just different things. But because she was so fit, she's physically healthy. She just has no short term memory. So even dealing with other family members, you know, or her friends, you know, explain to them that, yes, it mom seems like she's fine and seems like she can do these things, but she can't like she has no short term memory and understanding that and getting people to be more patient, me, myself, me starting with me to be more patient with her and then teaching others to help them interact in a way that still included her and dignified her as a, yes. a person that is present. And you are so right. It is overwhelming. It's overwhelming for everybody involved. Yes. And it's very complicated. And there's a lot of moving parts to it. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, they get a diagnosis of one of their loved ones that, that and then it's like, okay, we don't have a clue what we're supposed to do here. Yeah, what's next? With a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or one of the brain diseases doesn't come with a manual. No, nope. so, you know, you're scrambling around, you're stressed enough trying to deal with the reality that, you know, your loved one is ill. It's a yeah. progressive degenerative disease. It yep. could probably last eight to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much to deal with and then also have to learn how to deal with it and yep. figure out what resources are available. And so many people have told me we've had a difficult time finding resources on the day-to-day -day challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for me, I'm going to just speak from my experience. It was her general practitioner that diagnosed her and got medicine and 
And because she physically healthy, he said, that's the best solution for her. Don't move her anywhere. She wouldn't let me move there. She lives in El Paso. So I just started making some routines of things. I would travel out there to relieve my stepdad and her caregiver that I finally found about a year ago that is with her during the day just kind of a running buddy is what we call her. But even their descriptions of things were not in detail. I have not taken her to a neurologist because, you know, they were, were like, this medicine just makes it stable. It's never coming back. She could live two years. She could live 20 years. Like it was all so very vague. But mm-hmm. the number one thing that I feel I wish I would have known the first two years would have saved me a lot of tears is how to react and how to just communicate better with her. I've gotten much better over the years. I talk to her via Alexa every morning. So modern technology, I tell people use it, you know, that iPhone, the Android, whatever you got, a tablet, there is some way to have a video conference with them that you could talk to them every day if you need to, you know, for those who are who don't live right there with them. But, you know, knowing how to communicate and interact with them in a a way that that still leaves them with their dignity and leaves them with the respect that they deserve as a human and as your loved one. Yes. And most people that are going through their, especially early and mid stages of the dementia are aware. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, she's very aware. And, you know, at the end when their short-term memory is completely obliterated and they're just having to rely on their long-term memory, which stays intact for the entire disease. They are aware. And a lot of people don't think they're aware. Mm -hmm. They talk about them like they're not in the room or they don't understand what they're saying. And that's not true at all. You know, they're still thriving, living, breathing human beings. And I'd say the number one key or important thing to learn when faced with this disease is how to react, how to respond, how to communicate. Mm -hmm. People with brain disease can have very enriched, fulfilling lives Mm -hmm. and their loved ones can really enjoy high quality relationship if the guesswork is taken out of the equation. Yes. It's about education, knowledge, and just almost having to retrain yourself in the way you communicate with an individual with brain disease. Absolutely. I agree with that. I'm still learning. I'm not at all perfect, but once I realized how to react and respond and communicate with her, it definitely got better. I'm, yeah. Made a big I, difference, didn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I'm grateful that she refused to let me come home. So my in-between was setting up a room like I'm there all the time, which I'm there five days out of the month. And I just talk to her every day. And then I see her every month. So, and I see her every day because of the Alexa, but it was, you know, trying to figure out innovative tools using technology to just meet her where she's at. And, and one day I know I will have to be there full time, but until then, because we are so similar creatures, you know, I get my mom's tenacious personality, outgoingness and independence from her. I have to always remember that, that, yeah. that you know. Well, that's a great story that you got it figured out and you're enjoying your relationship with your mom. Yeah. I don't have it fully figured out, but it's definitely better than what it was. I do want to ask this question. What does it mean when they hide things all the time? (laughs) That's a great question. And I get that a lot because that's one of the very common behaviors of dementia. Not everybody does it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. And there isn't one explanation for why they do it. It They could be doing it for several different reasons. And I'll share a couple of those reasons. Most of us, our parents are kind of the depression era generation. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that we have found why some people hoard things and Mm -hmm. hide them is because it's reactive of their upbringing where things were very, very hard to come by. Yeah. They take things and hide them because they're, they're treasures. Yeah. Yeah. Some people do it because they're bored stiff Mm -hmm. and it's just something to do. Mm -hmm. Some people do it because they're completely unaware that they are doing it because Mm -hmm. their short-term memory is so damaged that they just take things, they hide them, and then they don't even remember or or aware that they did it. 
So there are many reasons why people do display that behavior. And trying to figure out the root cause of it is almost like having to be a detective mm -hmm. and know. So like, you know, my father, he had a very sad upbringing during the depression. Mm -hmm. If he had been displaying those kind of behaviors, I probably would have thought it was based on his upbringing in childhood where, you know, you couldn't get a piece of fruit or you, you had to stand in a, what they called bread line. And now all these years later, they remember those things were so hard to come by or some have even kind of gone back to that period of time in their life. And they see something that looks good. They take it and they hide it. So nobody can take it away from them. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple reasons why you see this type of behavior. And, you know, we could have 50 people that do the taking and the hiding and the hoarding, and there could probably be, you know, a different reason for each person yeah. why they're doing it. Yeah. Well, I kind of have an idea of why. That your mom does that? Yeah. What um, do you think is the reason why she does it? Well, she'll say that she's hiding it so that one of my siblings doesn't take it because, you know, the great mother that she is and has always been, whenever one of us needed something, it was like, oh, sure, I have an extra one, just take it, you know, or if she didn't, she would like, just take it and I'll get another one, you know, and now because, you know, she's limited income and, you know, she just, she automatically feels like, well, if I don't hide it, you know, I want them to ask me for it because if I don't hide it, then they're just going to take it and it's going to be, you know, I have to go get another one. So I. Think that's I a really reasonable explanation. Ab absolutely. It's, so yeah, I, it sounds like she's very aware that she is taking and hiding things. Well, it's the afterwards that she's not. So when she does it or when she can't find something, it's because, you know, one of my siblings took it. And then she's like, but don't say anything because she, she's a mother still at heart. You know, she loves her children and is like, but don't say anything to him. You know, like just well, let's go get another one. I'm like, okay, mom, but you know, like I'm the one who supplements you. So if we have got to go buy you something else, you know, like I don't have a problem in doing that, but let's really, if you really don't have it, let's make sure you don't have it before we go buy it. You know, like we have 20 nail clippers because she hides them every single time and things like that, that, you know, her, the cereal, just little things that I'm like, okay, let's find a place where we can put them all in one section. And then that way I'll know to go look there first because she'll laugh about it. She goes, Oh, I probably hit it. And you know, <laughs> we'll find it, you know, and she makes jokes. Oh, we'll find a lot when I'm gone. Like, you know, and it's her humor. And so I'm, I'm happy that she can, you know, laugh about it. But then when she gets frustrated or I'm frustrated and and I really don't want to go to the store or she really needs something at the point in time, that's when she's like, ah, why is this hidden? Or why, you know, whatever it is, is when it's not so funny, you know, and I have to take a deep breath and, it, and just say, okay, I'll go get another one or we'll get it. It's on the list or, you know, just whatever it is. Now, did you, did you mention that she still lives at home? Yes, yeah, she still lives in her home. You know, the doctor had said, don't move her. And so I didn't, she's not financially, it's a place where she could go into a facility. So, you know, I'm going to try and keep her in her own home as long as possible. I have everything set up with cameras and, you know, again, she knows she can call me on the Alexa and she does, which is awesome. I taught her that before. I think, you know, that part, you know, that was one of the last things she's able to remember, I feel. And then she has a caregiver that comes from seven until about three thirty or four. And mm -hmm. it's on call. If I need something in, you know, at night or something, she's great about going back over there to help her. With Terrific. Her. But yeah, I know that's, that's going to change and I'm prepared. So I'm still preparing for things as mm -hmm. they do, but yeah, it keeps her a little bit more stable. I think by her being in our own home for right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. People but, ask that all the time. How long should I keep my parent at home? And I think uh -huh. the best answer is, as long as you feel that they're still safe there. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. And that can, that varies from person to person. Yeah, 100%. She doesn't drive anymore, which is always a big dispute when she wants to go somewhere and there's nobody there to take her, but that was doctor recommended. And that's what we have to keep reminding her that the, the doctor said, but yeah, I, I do know that one day there will be a time when she 
is no longer safe in her own home yeah. by herself. But right now we're working through that. What is something that surprised you from, you know, being involved in the world of dementia? Well, I don't know if there's one particular thing that surprised me because every single incident or every single person's story is unique. Mm -hmm. And the behaviors don't really surprise me because I know that they're associated with the illness. Mm -hmm. There are some things that come out sometimes that are unexpected, but I don't really know that there's anything about dementia or brain disease that can surprise anyone because <laughs> what about common then what like since you've studied so many people what's common people are surprised most by? common things and and this piggybacks on your comment that you have to just learn extreme patience probably one of the most common behaviors that i've seen over the 25 years is repeatedly asking questions the same question mm -hmm. and it drives people nuts Mm -hmm. and they lose their patience mm -hmm. with their loved one and say, okay, for the 2700th time, it's the same answer I gave you yeah. the previous times you've asked me, but you really have to respect yourself and be so patient because they honestly don't remember that they just asked that same yeah. question two seconds ago. Yeah. It's the disease. This is mm -hmm. the disease. Yeah. So they're thinking they're asking you for the very first time where it could have been the 150th time. My recommendation for that is answer the question and then try to get them interested or, or redirected or on a different subject because sometimes they just don't let go of that same question because yeah. they don't think anybody's answered it. Yeah. Or if it becomes a 110th time, you can kind of make it comical where, you know, different answers might help you just break up the monotony and get you both laughing. You know, something that will make them laugh is always a great, I find that to be helpful and have had several conversations with people that say, yeah, they, you know, make a different answer each time to make it humorous for themselves or say something that will make it humorous for the other person so that you're not saying things like I already told you. You should never act like you've told them before. You should just repeat yourself. And I think that was a very hard thing to explain to others, but also hard thing to get into a pattern of doing. In the yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things that I have also found that's important to know is, you know, there are tools that you can have in your toolbox so when you recognize this behavior and there's you know best practices for responding or reacting but it's not foolproof we're talking about people's behaviors we're not talking mm -hmm. about you know true science and if one thing doesn't work you might need to try something else yeah might treat, need to try something, you know, several different techniques. Yeah, that's great advice. It's thing will work, and the next day, and a lot of times people's frustration is getting their loved one to take a bath or a shower, mm -hmm. because a lot of times they just don't want to, and they refuse, and that's frustrating to the loved one. Yeah. It's a variety of techniques. If one thing doesn't work, try this, or then try that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that nothing set in stone, not yeah. one particular technique will work a hundred percent of the time. You might need to try something else because yeah. we're, you know, we're talking about human beings and they've got, you know, moods like we do and mm -hmm. always feel like doing something at that very moment. And we're going to say, no, I don't want to do that. And well, it's the same for our loved ones when they have <laughs> cognitive impairment. Maybe yeah. they don't feel like taking a shower or yeah. maybe they feel like, you know, doing that activity. But that doesn't mean that, you know, they're just being obstinate. It might just be they just simply don't feel like it at that moment. Yeah. So there's different things to try, different ways to see if you can kind of get them interested in it. And if not, that's okay. Try again later. Yeah. Yeah. 
my mom always says, where am I going? You know, if she's not going to see anybody or to be around anybody, especially my stepdad, because she spends weekends with him. She always says, well, I'm not sleeping with anybody or I'm not going to go see anybody. So, <laughs> and we're like, okay. So Sandra is her name. Big shout out. She's an, an angel, but she now does a little calendar of, well, okay, you played tennis today or yesterday. You know, if they, she physically was active, then, you know, she takes a shower as soon as she gets home. And then, you know, she's set for a day or two because she's on the calendar. She marks it for her C. Or if we're going to go somewhere and she's physically going to see somebody or see my stepdad, she'll, you know, you got to take a shower, got to get pretty. And so then she's okay with that. But if she's just going to be at home or there's nothing really major going on, she doesn't, does not want to take a shower. Well, it sounds like you found a wonderful caregiver that <laughs> really understands the illness and knows how to react and respond to it. That's that's worth its weight in gold. Oh, it is. So she's learning as she goes. And I, uh -huh. but the fact that she is so patient with her and my mom likes her, that was what was the weight in gold and that she can have fun and, and be interactive with her and, and that she's honest and that she's caring for the things that my mom makes her sad or happy. And, you know, that she follows my direction. And when it comes to finances and getting things done, you know, that is absolutely its weight and goal because it took me a while, believe me, but we're both learning as we go. And, and I, I do value her very much. I value all caregivers that, that do that yeah. for their loved ones for sure. So, oh, that's the hardest job on earth. I it think. is absolutely. So tell folks how they can get a hold of you and where they can go to buy your book as well. Well, the book's on amazon.com. There's okay. a regular paperback book that's available. And then there's also and an e audio of it, audio yeah. version of it. Awesome. Download to Kindle and some of those other electronic things. <laughs> and probably the best way to communicate with me is through my blog. Okay. It's on Facebook and it's called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. And again, I post on a regular basis, information about dementia, the behavior, just tips, mm -hmm. a lot of really, you know, hopefully valuable information that, that people can use in their day-to-day -day challenges with their loved ones. And if you want to ask me something, mm -hmm. just type it in and I will respond. Awesome. Well, you're definitely doing a great service by putting out those tips and I look forward to listening to your audiobook because I know that it's an ever evolving disease and as a part-time caregiver but you know I feel my mom brought me into this world and she should be going out in the in the happiest style possible <laughs> or the happiest yeah, mood possible I totally agree with you so I want to make sure that I do my best and there are times that I know that I could do better and I just try to not beat myself up and do the best that I can because it's a process. It takes a village for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Lisa. Sounds like you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. With a lot of people's help. <laughs> I have to say that, but thank you again for joining me today. I, I really appreciate you sharing your story, your knowledge. My pleasure. Thanks again for inviting me on the podcast. Awesome. Thank you. And to the listeners, uh, thank you for tuning in today. If you know somebody who could use Lisa's story, please share the podcast. And while you're there sharing, please rate the podcast wherever you're listening to it, whether it's on iTunes, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, YouTube, or Amazon Alexa. And until next week, remember sharing is caring. And to all the caregivers listening, take care of yourself so you can continue taking care of your loved one and others. And to all those that have not had this tough conversation with your family about the what if something happens and they get dementia and they can no longer take care of themselves, then what? What is the plan? Take it from this daughter with a mother with dementia. I wish I'd had that tough conversation with her because tomorrow is promised to no one. Thank you.